Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 851. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 16th, 2024. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We are glad you could be here. It's April 16th, and if you're an American and you spent the last couple weeks filling out your taxes, you're like, what was this American Revolution thing all about? And if you are a resident of the UK, you're like, those idiots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, I, I <clears throat> paid a lot of money to the government. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> ouch. Not as much as you used to. You used to have to pay Connecticut state income yeah, tax. No, to, yeah. In fact, I don't have to. I don't even have to file with Connecticut uh, with Florida. Uh, I get to, uh, to the end of TurboTax. Would you like to file your state tax? No, I don't need to. I live in Florida now. There's no tax. Uh, uh, I Jill and I got a twelve percent raise when we moved to Florida. Isn't that crazy? That's why everybody else is doing well, it too. So. Yeah. Chamber of Commerce message from the state of Florida. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good weather, no taxes. Yeah. Okay, so Jill and I have been driving for about uh, nine days now. We're currently uh, spending a couple days in Oklahoma City. I saw a great uh, memorial with the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial, which is downtown Oklahoma. It happened almost 29 years ago, uh, April 19th of uh, uh, 29 years ago, 1995. Uh, when gas was one dollar and eight cents a gallon here in america and uh, it is an amazing memorial to go through it takes up uh, uh, three floors of a building and you walk through it's a very immersive uh, uh museum where you uh get to experience uh, you know to a certain degree uh, the sounds and sights that uh, people that, that day experienced uh when it was the federal building was bombed by timothy mcveigh and uh mcnichols and uh wow uh, two and a half hours you get through it you can see how the city responded to the bombing how they recovered and how they went on after that and it was very impressive and uh, I'll post some uh, stuff on pretending we are retired later this week pictures and video I took there um, but I've been to a lot of uh, different monuments and memorials the last three years this this beats them all George by by a million percent so Oh, that's neat. Yeah, that's congratulations exciting. to the people of Oklahoma City. Something like that, you're just like, <gasps> well, New York did it when they overcame 9-11. Oklahoma City did it when they came over uh, the bombing. All right, we need to move on to this news. You and I are just talking. People are going, get on with it. So you sent me an Adobe PDF and said, Kevin, these are the things we should talk about. And we're going to talk more about that document that's coming out of Rome, the Dignitas Infiti oh, Infataya. Uh, George, I didn't take Latin. Pronounce that for me. Dignitas infinita. I was so close. Infinite dignity. I was so close. Oh, and, and you yours I, sounds like an item on a Mexican <laughs> restaurant menu. Yeah, I, I try and read it like a menu. Now, the the funny we talked about this last week. You know, um, this document uh, is pure in its delivery of the doctrine that humans have infinite dignity, and you and I were quickly going to go and. I, are you sure that we have infinite? God certainly does. Uh, the Trinity certainly does. But man does not have infinite di dignity, especially after the fall. And let's talk about what you read and found in the document. And does this continue the, the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church or change it? Death penalty, George. That's an exa excellent example. Um, the initial... Kevin's and my initial read was that, hey, there's good stuff in here, but also there's some squirrely stuff. In other words, it starts off with this squirrely business, which for, for non-American uh, viewers means a little, oh, I don't know if I agree with this. hanky panky ish yes. And, and it talked about man's, you know, each person, men and women have infinite dignity. Well, no, the creator has infinite dignity, not the created. And you and I are created beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, but you know that's theology, and so and we get into it, and there's some great stuff about no to no to transgender surrogate, no to surrogate, you know, surrogacy, which is where 
uh, say a gay couple wants to pay a woman to have a womb for rent, to have a child so they could raise the child and so on. That's all contrary to the Christian faith, the Catholic Church said, and I agree with all that. And then they take this infinite dignity concept and then they apply it to other things, which I'm going, hey, wait a second, that's not quite what I understand the Christian faith to be. And one example we mentioned uh, last week was the uh, that laws that uh, criminalize uh, homosexual behavior, such as they have in Uganda, such as we had in the United States until ba- uh, Bowers versus Hardwick in Texas, mm-hmm. they violate God's law. So the Ugandan Anti-Gay Act, uh, which caused a great deal of uh, hubbub, we reported last week about how one bishop was denied a U.S. visa from Uganda because of the bad things Uganda is doing on the gay front, the Biden administration believes. The Biden administration and the liberal West now has another arrow in their quiver saying the Catholic Church says you can't have sodomy laws. And then another thing, as you get deeper into this, they now say that the death penalty violates the infinite dignity of man. Now, John Paul II wasn't keen on the death penalty, and Francis certainly is opposed to the death penalty, but it has never been a statement of Christian faith that the death penalty violates Christian teaching. In fact, in the uh, Articles of Religion of the Church of England, it says the death penalty is allowable. It is something that the magistrate can impose. But now we've got, and we've now got the Catholic Church changing, not just developing, but changing one of its fundamental teachings, such that now the death penalty, which was licit, which was lawful, which could be used, and in fact, the Vatican City States, up until they were merged into Italy, had its own executioner. (laughs) Uh, So somebody need to tell the tell that to uh, uh, the Vatican Francis, but it's now evil, it's now wrong, and now violates the dignity of the created people. Now, I understand the arguments. Um, I love to listen to a fellow named Michael Francis, who has a podcast. He's a former captain in the Colombo uh, family. He's a mafia don who 30 years ago became a born-again Christian when he was in prison. And he's had a ministry and he's out of you know he's been out of the mafia and all this and that and he and he's really a fascinating fellow to listen to talk to and he is a devoted christian and one of the things he says is that he opposes the death penalty because he's met some people who have been wrongfully convicted and in his mind that it's better that uh nine in nine guilty men be given life sentences rather than the one man be executed mm-hmm. So I can understand there is some power to that argument because, that, as we've seen recently, the justicism isn't as perfect as we once thought. But and that's that kind of makes sense, you know. Uh, there is no justice system in the world that uh, is completely unbiased. Uh, even though we, here we say the lady justice is blind, uh, there, there's always going to be bias in the justice system, and there are many people here who have been found innocent. Uh, over the years and have had to be paid by the state uh, for the time they were incarcerated. And, you know, with the modernization of DNA testing and uh, forensic science and uh, opening of cold cases, we found that there are some very prominent cases of the past that the person who was found guilty in the end was innocent. And we have... I read a book about uh, two or three people who actually were given the death penalty who after that years later were found to be innocent. Mm -hmm. Okay. That doesn't happen often. Mm -hmm. It's rare, but it does happen. And then against that, you have, you just were in Oklahoma city. What did we do to Timothy McVeigh after he was caught? (laughs) Well, and here, um, Timothy McVeigh was, uh, put between, uh, before a jury of his peers who tried him on the case that he murdered 168 people by placing a, a bomb in a truck outside the federal building, blew it up. Of that, you know, like 30 were children, uh, many were federal officers, and uh, Jarvis Pierce found him guilty. And then 
Here in Oklahoma, if you're going to get the death penalty, it has to be unanimous. Those 12 jurors have to come back and say unanimously that Timothy McVeigh deserves the death penalty. And, you know, after you go through this whole tour, you get there, and I'm not a big fan of the death penalty. You would probably, you know, say, Kevin, are you a proponent of the death penalty? Not really. Um, I prefer we, you know, we didn't have it. But boy... If anybody really deserved it, it was designed for the Timothy McVeighs. You know, they, does K Timothy McVeigh deserve the death penalty? And my response would be, in a country that has the death penalty, he would certainly be the, the perfect candidate for it. And that, and I, was, yeah, I would leave it there. Yeah, at, at here in Florida, we have the case of uh, Ted Bundy, yeah. a serial killer uh, who killed people in Colorado and Washington State, and they don't know well, the total number of his deaths. Mostly women. Well, I think all women. I'm, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he, preyed on, he preyed on young girls, yeah. and he finally made his way to Florida. They don't have the death penalty in Washington State. They do have it in Florida, and he was caught and tried and convicted for breaking into a sorority house at the University of Florida State and killing some girls. And I mean, this man is, was a monster, a human monster. And what was so very scary was that he was so very attractive looking and reasonable. He was a law student. He was charismatic, a good looking, charismatic mm -hmm. fellow. He was a human, he was a psychopath, a sociopath. Does, did, if anybody deserved the death penalty, it was Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. After the Second World War, uh, do the guilty people at Nuremberg, the Hermann Goerings and the, the people who ran the death camps, uh, did they deserve the death penalty? Yes, I think so. So you, you've got the mistakes are made versus the monsters where there's no doubt, there's no doubt that uh, uh, Joseph Kramer, the commandant at Belson concentration camp, you know, was guilty of yep. crimes against humanity, murdering hundreds of thousands of people. Where's the line? But now the Catholic Church says we must not, we may not execute the Ted Bundys, the Timothy McVeighs, the Nazi genocidal people. And I and I don't agree that that I don't agree with that mm. um, myself. Uh, I don't think there's a biblical warrant for it. We certainly have biblical examples of the death penalty and its usage. However, I do believe, as you very eloquently said, Kevin, in the uh, in the concept of mercy and really trying to get to the bottom of things and not just having some revolving line of, ah, you probably did it, so that's enough, boom, let's get rid of you. Um, so it's, but here's the, th here's the thing from a theological perspective. This is a change, not a development, mm -hmm. not a, not, this is a reversal of a almost 2,000 year old teaching tradition in the Catholic Church. Sure through the guise of this new theology. Now, the church has been advocating for the elimination of the death penalty on the grounds of mercy and compassion and this and that, and the possibility of eventual reform, that the person will, like the mafia don in prison, after six years in solitary confinement in the federal penitentiary, he discovers Jesus Christ, and he's lived a productive, reformed life. Maybe that, you know, I hope for all people like that. But to have a blanket change with this sort of loosey-goosey statement on infinite dignity, which is theological foundation, I think is is questionable. I'm, well, not too, I'm not so sure on this. You know, he, I've heard people argue, you know, we have to have the death penalty because it's a preventative. If people know that that, that is a uh, something that could be applied to them if they kill somebody, I don't think that that's real anymore. I don't think the death penalty enters into the human decision making about whether or not a crime is going to be committed. I agree with you on that, you know, I, I, I'm involved in prison ministry here and I meet 18, 19, 20 year old gangbangers from Miami who killed somebody. Mm -hmm. They have, they're not mature enough to think that way. Mm -hmm. But then if there's somebody you're in our age, we would probably think twice if we knew that we would be executed. In other words, not every person who enters into a crime does so through logical, reasonable analysis. Mm -hmm. Very few do. Yeah. 
All right, let's move on to a different story. So we cover the death penalty. Uh, my thing with uh, infinite dignity, if we had infinite dignity, we never would have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. You know, uh, if God understood us to have infinite dignity, um, things would have turned out a lot different. Oh, Eve, Adam, you're fine. You got infinite dignity. Eat from that you know tree of knowledge. And so, you know, whatever. Let's move on to our next story. Uh, Welby's call to prayer. We got a couple uh, email responses to his call to prayer because of its engrossingness. Uh, calling everybody to prayer, believers, non-believers, every religion, um, when he's visiting a town in the UK. And I need to talk, up, you, you and I should talk about the politics of being the Archbishop, not just the doctrine of being the Archbishop. Yeah, we received uh, a number of emails and, uh, from people with a copy of Justin Welby's uh, tweet. He had gone, I think he was up in Leeds, or he was up in the north, mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> doing a faith, doing a city prayer or city mission, and he uh, issued a call and asked everybody to join with him, all Christians, uh, people of no faith, people of other faiths, and all of us praying together can help change the city of Leeds. And he says, and then he went on to say, prayer is not what we do, it's what God does. And I don't agree with that necessarily, uh, that last bit. But the complaints that we received, or the, question, the, the charges we received, look, well, he's being a heretic because he's engaging in syncretism. That a Hindu or an eighth or Richard Dawkins or a Muslim uh, can pray, and that would have the same efficacy as a Christian does because Christ tells us the only way to the Father is through the Son. Mm -hmm. That the, the, the Gospels are fairly clear that there's no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. And to encourage, so here's the th thing, is, is Welby a Christian leader? And if he's a Christian leader, then uh, calling for prayers from all gods for the city, that's a terrible thing. If he's a political leader, then that's a good thing because he's trying to create a civic sense of responsibility. Now, but, what, what if what if uh, Elijah said to the priests of Baal, well, you fellows, you know, you have your gods, I have mine, let's just all pray and, uh, and uh, not just ask uh, whoever is God to destroy the other fellows' priests, but rather just make us all happy. You know, what is well, in other words, is the Church of England's Erastianism, which is its connection with the state, that the Church of England is a department of the state like the post office or the library system? Well, doesn't that... Overwhelming so, its faithfulness. I mean, that ties his hands a little bit. I, uh, let's talk a little bit about tied hands. 1982, uh, I was led to uh, a faith in Christianity by a, a man named Pastor Paul Sheely. And Pastor Paul Sheely was charismatic and had this amazing faith. And when you sat in a circle and prayed with him, holy cow, of course God's gonna answer that prayer. He had, he had very great prayer and uh, you know, a man of great faith. And so I was real happy when he was invited by the uh, uh, high school to give the graduation prayer at my graduation. He was one of the city priests. And he stood up there and he delivered a much different prayer than I remember him praying in the church and with uh, prayer circles and, and and those brothers and sisters in Christ. It was not a non-Christian prayer, but boy, in my mind, I thought he was going to just swell the audience and the Holy Spirit would just fall upon the, the high school gymnasium because he pr would pray so well. He offered a political prayer for that time in front of the people that he was uh, going to pray for. And for me, it was eye-opening. Okay, well, uh, I, uh, why? You had a great, you had the greatest opportunity in, in, in probably your ministry to bring the, the purest gospel message to your audience or to an audience here at the high school gymnasium. He delivered a prayer for the future of the students um, that they would uh, certainly know God but know uh, their families and, and, and go on and be fruitful in their lives. Much different than I would have found within in the, 
the building that he preached from. Welby here is in the north and he wants to be the Archbishop of Peace. He said that many times. And I think this tweet is a call to peace, especially when the Middle East is a war. You know, and I'm not, if you've watched Anglican Inc., I'm not a big defender of Walby. But, you know, I understand when you have to be political in nature sometimes, George. But against, and I agree with Kevin, the points that you make, and they're very strong. Mm -hmm. And you, and I, too, am not a great defender of Justin Welby. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think he's made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. But the church he leads is in crisis. It's, a, it's in a crisis of faith. What does it stand for? What does it believe? And were I him, I would take these opportunities to strengthen the gospel and speak to those people whose hearts are open to the movement of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here we are in little Citrus County um, uh, where I live, and I'm, you know, I've been invited to address the monthly meeting of the county commissioners. And I first time I did it, you know, 10 years ago, it was exciting, it was fun. I don't get paid for it, and you know, this or that. And then, but then they have these little guidelines, you know, that they gave me that, you know, because they want to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I've declined to do it ever since because I didn't want to be constricted in what I've, when I pray, I don't pray as if I'm given a speech. I pray because as I believe the Spirit is leading me. But then again, we are not in a nasty state. My showing up at a county commissioner's meeting is neither here nor there, um, nor is the showing up with any of the other pastors or priests or rabbi. We only have a rabbi, so not plural, in the county. But for Justin Welby, I think what is more important, the position of the church within the social structure of England, or is the evangelization or re-evangelization of England more important? And how does he wear those two hats? I don't know. Yeah, he doesn't. Okay, I mean, to be very fair, he does not wear those two hats. He is just the Archbishop of Peace. Okay, and uh, when you are just the Archbishop of Peace, you get a church in crisis, as we've well identified in uh, almost 10 years here on Anglican uh, Unscripted. All right, let's move on to another op-ed we read from the Church Times. And uh, this is a settlement of dispute on live and let live terms, good for all. And we've talked about um, certainly the sacrifices and decisions made in the past with changes to the Church of England doctrine, women clergy, uh, women bishops, uh, mutual flourishing. And we've kind of pointed out where these have gone awry, have gone off course and don't work. And here's the Church Times editorial is kind of trying to deal with that, George. Ed Shaw is the vice chairman or co-chairman or one of the leaders of the Church of England Evangelical Council. He's a layman and he has, and he's a member of General Synod. And he has penned an op-ed piece in the Church Times, essentially saying, you know, let us each do our own thing. Uh, as Mao Zedong used to say, let a thousand flowers bloom, let a hundred flowers bloom, a thousand uh, thoughts contend. Yes. You know, live and let live. Well, we tried that in the Episcopal Church. And just as it happened in China, when you allowed those thousand thoughts to com uh, compete and a hundred flowers to bloom, that allowed Mao to get rid of all his opponents because they mm -hmm. self identify. In the Episcopal Church, live and let live meant search and destroy. Uh, it started off, you know, when I was a brand new priest in the 90s, it was, we need to show respect for this minority and live and let live. And today, the latest uh, battle was, Bill Love, unless you agree with us totally, you must be kicked out as Bishop of Albany. It went from being uh, respect for minority to you must conform. And what Ed Shaw is asking for is rational, it's reasonable, but what Ed Shaw is not speaking to is that his opponents are ideologues, they're revolutionaries, and they seek to destroy that which does not conform to their worldview or to their vision. Um, 
if you do not agree with the agenda of the gay and lesbian movement, uh, as I've been told uh, by, I was told this by Charles Benison, I'm either crazy, evil, or stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, if I do not agree with his position that uh, the same-sex marriage is of God, I'm crazy, evil, or stupid. Um, I guess I must be evil because I'm not crazy and I'm not <laughs> stupid. But this is, and because I'm evil, I must be driven out of the church. Mm -hmm. And this is the inevitable logic of the opponents of Ed Shaw. So Ed Shaw's words on their own are well-meaning and I think, and thoughtful, but they are so far past the point of matching the reality of the situation that they're basically, you know, I'm sorry, but nice try, but that game ended a long time ago. But there was a time, 1950s, 60s, early 60s, that bishops like Bishop Love, Duncan, and Ackerman had the majority opinion. That they were the, were the majority opinion in the church. And I think one of the problems was, as liberalism started to enter the church, they, maybe not th them exactly, but the bishops in the, of the church adopted the live and let live. Hey, we as conservative bishops, we're just going to live and let live and uh, let this liberalism seep into the church. And that, in the end, made them the minority. Yes, that's, you know, Jack Spong, <clears throat> Bishop of Newark, famous for destroying his diocese in terms of attendance and everything mm -hmm. like that. Cut it by a third, I think it was, the number of people from the end, beginning to the end of his time. Spong was always a bit of a outlier, a, a nut job, a real, you know, denying the resurrection, denying, you know, the virgin birth, denying all the central tenets of Christ and the creeds. And the response to the House of Bishops was like a gentleman's club. Well, that's just Jack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll tolerate it because he's a decent fellow and he means well, he's just wrong. Well, what happens is after, you know, after Jack is elected, then Jack 2, Jack 3, Jack 4, Jack 5, so that you finally wind up with Catherine Jefford Shorey, uh, a hard-nosed ideologue who to oppose her is to be a misogynist, it's to be homophobic, it's to be evil. In other words, the debate never entered into rational exchange of ideas and tr seeking to discern God's will was not, has not been part of the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church's worldview for a very long time. And I don't no longer believe it's part of the Church of England's General Synod's worldview, that uh, through reason debate and through waiting upon the Spirit, we shall come to a resolution. Um, there are calls for, you know, the Church of England Evangelical Council has called for differentiation of uh, a third province, if you will. Martin Davy, a theologian, uh, has put out a, a piece saying, you know, yes, this is perfectly legal and possible because the reality is the only way you're going to protect the uh, conservative evangelicals, the only way you're going to protect Ed Shaw is by having a parallel church system with his own diocese, archbishops, bishops. You can all be part of the Church of England, but you will not be responding to every charge that the watch or the lay and gay and lesbian Christian movement throws at you. No. And I don't think what Ed and others understand is clearly Ed does not seek to destroy the liberalism in the church. That's not his mm -hmm. goal. But the liberalism within the Church of England seeks to destroy him and those who are like him. And they do that every day. They get up and that's their mission. How do we rid ourselves of these Orthodox Christians? How do we rid ourselves of this misogynist, these homophobes? And it, what little little yeah. example we had uh, the <clears throat> an archdeacon Miranda Threlfill Threlfill Jones or yes, something. Like that, yeah. uh, she <clears throat> she uh, attended a conference on on. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and came out afterwards with uh, all these tweets basically saying the problem are white men, and, you know, we need to attack whiteness, and we need to attack maleness, and we need to drive far from it so that the church can thrive in the absence of, of these horrible, horrible people. 
the woman the woman is racist she's racist against her own race mm -hmm. she's a white anti-white racist and she's um i don't know what the the equivalent of a misogynist is against a man but uh there's a word for it know, she's a uh, she she's an archdeacon and she's repeating words that in her circles and in the that community in which she moves within the Church of England are now the current ideas that the enemy must be destroyed. Uh, it's called misandry. Misandry. Yeah, that's, that's right. the opposite. All right, let's move on to our next story. And this is, I don't like to do this, and we don't do it a lot, but sometimes within the church, you have priests who do things that are uh, not just unethical, but. Uh, Sondry. What, what, I don't even know what word I'm looking for. Uh, it's not fun to report on, but we had some uh, priests that we're going to report, we're going to give the stories on who did stuff that uh, is of a, a abhorrent nature. George, let's talk about first the the diocese of Fort Worth, Episcopal. Uh, the it's not the diocese of Fort Worth, but it's the Episcopal Church the in Fort, Fort Worth, Worth. Yes, which Thank is you. part of the diocese of Texas now. Yeah. Uh, right. Trinity Church in Fort Worth is, uh, I think the largest or one of the larger, mm -hmm. one or two of the larger churches that stayed with the Episcopal Church nationally. Well, on uh, Thursday, its curate was arrested by the police. It's a married man with children, and he was arrested for internet solicitation of minors for sex. And uh, the Diocese of Texas announced over the weekend that he had been suspended pending the criminal investigation. Now, he's not been convicted, and I hope this is all a terrible mistake. Um, but if he is convicted, he's going to go away for a very long time. Yeah. And his wife and his kids' lives will be destroyed. Yeah. Up in yeah. Toronto. Up in, go ahead. We had another story this week up in Toronto, a priest who is also a contributor to the Anglican Journal. In other words, somebody who really is active in the life of the Canadian church. He was... Uh, arrested and found guilty of uh, public indecency. Uh, and it made clear that it was not with another person. So what that means, he was exposing himself to people. He's a flasher. Um, and then, why do we mention this? But there's a tendency to idolize clergy. To, to in any, And it's not just in the Anglican and Catholic world that we have clericalism. It's very true in the Protestant world where ministers are just held to be, you know, greater uh, height uh, form of being. Uh, for instance, uh, we had uh, a, a conference, a big men's Christian mega conference this past weekend, and a male stripper was invited on the stage to perform. He was a stripper and a sword swallower, and he did his act. This is a Christian men's conference. And I think... Uh, uh, the name just went out of my head. He's a famous Mark evangelical Driscoll. leader. Mark Driscoll. Mark Driscoll yeah. got up and said, look, this is wrong. We can't do this. You know, this is anti-Christian. And Driscoll was kicked out of the conference. He had a Calvin Robinson experience. <laughs> but instead of being the cause of the problem, yeah. allegedly for Calvin, he was pointing out the incongruity of a mega church totally succumbing to the to the cultural Marxism of the world by having male strippers at a Christian men's retreat. I mean, who would want to see that first off? But, you know, this is not just an Anglican problem or a Catholic problem. This problem of fallen, broken clergy, pastors, is universal. It is. It's universal. Uh, we've seen it in the ACNA where they've had to hold a priest and bishops accountable, you know, uh, for, uh, being less than a bishop, being less than a priest. And people, we live in a fallen world. I am a fallen, sinful individual. I uh, seek daily to uh, uh, pick up my cross and, and follow Christ. But, you know, okay, I just filled up my taxes. I had some very evil thoughts about my government. Now, but, you know, we don't need another American revolution today. But holy cow. So yeah. how many missiles did you buy for <laughs> Iran, <laughs> Kevin? With your holy cow. Well, you know, and that's our next story, George, as we move on. Um, the Middle East. But, but I, I, I do want to have one thing. Hmm? As in most things, Ronald Reagan was right. Trust, but verify. Absolutely. Trust oh, yeah. your ministries, but verify. <laughs> verify. Keep them on a short leash. Absolutely. 
Um, and that's the nature of our fellowship together, is to work together to encourage one another in Christ. And to, you know, throughout the New Testament, hold one another, another accountable, but including yourself in that. I know so many people who um, don't walk the walk. You know, they, they like the talk talk. They like to have the political emphasis of being a cultural Christian that came up in the last two weeks. Um, but in the end, they don't have that, that faith component where they, they're able to get on their knees and use the, the spiritual transformation for their lives and for the people around them. And that, that's hard to watch. But it's out there, George. Foley Beach and others call for prayers for peace in Israel. That's our next story. But George, that's the only two voices I heard was the, the Irish and Foley Beach calling for peace. Uh, we've seen the tensions between uh, Free Palestine and Defend Israel for the last six months since October 7th. And I've watched the Episcopal Church and the, the Anglican Church in uh, uh, the UK and uh, other denomin denominations around the world take one side or the other. Uh, very few try to take that middle ground. The war is is happening. Uh, Iran sent a, a bunch of drones to Israel, and I hear two archbishops call for peace. What? What's going this on? Is, this, well, this is this could be from the Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze, where, Sil where Sherlock Holmes says to the detective, uh, the curious incident of the dog in the night. Yeah. Well, the dog did dog nothing in the night. He didn't that was the curious incident. Yeah, no the barking. dog didn't bark. Mm -hmm. Here we have Foley Beach and the bishops of Armagh and Dublin, the two Irish archbishops, issue statements almost immediately calling for peace and reconciliation mm -hmm. and bemoaning this intensification. Mm -hmm. There may have been other statements out there, but I didn't see any from Michael Curry or from Justin Welby or Stephen Cottrell or the Bishop of Southwark. And those who have been quite vocal in their statements, uh, peace now, ceasefire now, all of a sudden these guys who have been on the uh, Palestinian side have found themselves, they don't think they've moved, but all of a sudden it's been revealed that not only have been on the Palestinian side, they've really been on the Iranian side. And Iran is the actor who is engaged in war with Israel in Gaza mm -hmm. and with Hamas. And it's not just these poor Palestinians, it is Iran manipulating them and using them to engage in warfare with Israel. And, you know, this week, the Justin Welby put out a piece, oh, this Palestinian Anglican woman was arrested by Israeli police. Isn't that a terrible thing? Well, we don't know what she's done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe she's it's not that every Anglican in Palestine is a wonderful person. Hanan Ashrawi, who, if you remember your history, was always by Yasser Arafat's side, was an Anglican laywoman, a leader in the diocese. And she was not only an Anglican laywoman, she was a member of the PLO Central Committee. A very, very... <clears throat> well, I'll uh, pause yeah, there and not well, yeah, characterize her. But so, we don't, so, so Welby is quick to respond to, oh, one of our parishioners was arrested. Oh, this is intolerable. Or, or oh, an aid convoy was hit. Oh, this is intolerable. And not waiting to find out within the aid convoy were embedded Hamas terrorists, or what has this woman done to be arrested? Mm -hmm. And now when we have the actual state against state actions, when Welby would jump loudly and protest Russia attacking Ukraine, to my and I may have this totally wrong, but I've not seen it out of yeah. eight fifteen or Lambeth Palace. Either of if, if I'm wrong, yeah. maybe you know, maybe maybe it's just slow and coming. Curry's been sick, and Welby's up in Leeds, and maybe they don't have telephones up. There. I don't know. Well, but here's the reality: war is hell. War is messy, and we're watching the Middle East get more and more tense, more and more tense, and when. Iran launched their drones. I full, firmly believe that the leadership of Iran was hoping none of them got through and that they did everything politically they could do to let Israel know these drones are on their way. They're going to be at this elevation. They're going to be at this. Uh, these are the targets. 
for the love of God, shoot them down and don't fire back at us. Iran does not ever want to get into a war with Israel, ever. But they don't mind being the proxy for Hamas, Hezbollah, the Gaza Strip, and uh, the West Bank. They, they love doing that. They've been at war uh, with Israel for, for generations doing that. But they, they don't want to ever have to face Israel face to face. But in terms of what we're seeing here, this is classic Middle Eastern saber rattling. You know, they'll sit there and spit at each other all day long, rattle their sabers, but in the end, Iran doesn't want to die. And when you're taking, you know, certainly Israel's not quite a NATO country yet, um, but it, it's as close a relationship as you could have with the U.S. and uh, Europe as Israel has. Do you really want it to, to engage in that? Uh, right now, Iran itself has horrible political problems internally in the country. Every, you know, they almost got overthrown in the Arab Spring, and it hasn't changed since. The, the youth in that country are sick of the leadership of Iran, and they know that. And that's why they sent the, the drones over to, to show that, hey, we do have some gumption. But George, uh, in reality, I thought the, the Iranian leaders at the end of that uh, folly uh, the night before were like, Whew, thank God none of them hit anybody. Well, what some of the press reports we're seeing out of Europe, you, mm -hmm. you don't see that, friends, if you, if, you, if you seek to derive your news from the networks in the United States, the BBC, you're going to mm -hmm. miss most of the real stuff um, because it doesn't fit the narrative that's already been pre-written. Uh, the Iranian government informed the Swiss of what they were going to do before they did it and said on this time and at this date, we're going to be launching these sorts of things towards Israel. So we want you Swiss in your consulate in Tel Aviv to take cover. Well, knowing full well the Swiss would tell everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that when these rockets and drones came over, not only was Israel primed and ready, but the United States and Saudi Arabia helped, helped engage and knock down these things. It's like, you know, you're a duck hunter and the ducks are telling you we're going to come over at 4.44 a.m. at uh, 200 feet from the southeast. Get ready. And, of course, they were ready. But th now there's also that danger of what if something got through, George? You know, right now, Israel ha can take time to respond and can always have that threat we're planning to respond. They don't have to. But they get every morning, put out a press release, we are working on targets within Iran to respond to. And Iran, the, the Iran leader today said, well, we can take this all the way to nukes if we have to. So, great, sable rattling, keep each other busy, just stop shooting. And let's find a way to stop Iran's proxy war. Let's, let's take that out. And I don't know how we do that because uh, they have so much money through oil and uh, they can spend it on whatever they want and they've been fighting Israel uh, for generations now. I, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, other than to get rid of the current uh, leadership of Iran, George? Well, just to put things in perspective, uh, when the Biden administration ended the sanctions, oil embargoes against Iran, mm -hmm. that freed up Iran to sell its oil. And Iran's oil sell sales since that time have been greater than the combined uh, aid to Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine from the United States. Mm -hmm. So they've got more money to spend on these weaponry mm -hmm. than we've been giving the Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting world. It is. I remember, you know, Obama's uh, interaction with Iran. Uh, we had a drone that crash landed in Iran. And instead of sending fighters to blow up the drone, we let them have that technology. Now, clearly, it has not done a lot for them. But uh, we also uh, paid to have... Iranian hostages returned to us through Obama. He sent over a plane full of money from frozen bank accounts to have hostages sent back here to be re repatriated on, on our soil. We've always had a, po a policy, you don't pay terrorists. Well, Obama broke that. And years later, we're seeing the fruits of that. Let's talk a little bit more about news in the UK. 
independent reviewer finds appointment of Philip North uh, as bishop was properly done and you know it was not a big deal that he does not like women priests stop making a big deal about this Kevin and George stop uh, Philip North was a diocesan bishop, uh, was a suffragan area bishop yep. who was appointed in diocesan. Philip North is a member of the society. He is not a supporter of women priests, but he will tolerate them in the diocese in which he leads. Where, upon his appointment, Watch, which is uh, one of the women's advocacy groups and others, uh, launched challenges to his appointment, saying he could not be a good bishop because he couldn't be bishop for all people. Mm -hmm. Well, the... Uh, when the Church of England came up with its uh, five guiding principles um, to basically sort of find a way to live and let live, one of those principles was that a, being a traditionalist was not a bar to being a diocesan bishop. Well, Watch and company have basically been pursuing what we call lawfare in the United States. This is what, if you will, the Democrats are doing with Donald Trump and people and the world courts doing with Israel and other places, fighting them in the law courts to sort of delay and sap their strength and time and basically make them give up. Well, the independent reviewer found that uh, there was no mistake made, all the procedures were properly followed in the appointment of Philip North, but then uh, the, the reviewer had some comments that it was okay for Watch to make these complaints. And Forward and Faith put out a statement, which we released on Anglican Inc., we're basically saying, look, uh, if, the, if the independent reviewer is saying that anybody who's got a grudge or doesn't like someone for personal reasons and theological reasons can basically mount these legal challenges, which the church will pay for and run through and put Philip North and whoever else is on through the microscope, then we truly don't have uh, mutual flourishing because li no liberal is put through these, uh, no woman is put through these uh, steps, but only traditional conservatives. And for that matter, no traditional evangelical has been made a diocesan bishop under these principles, even though they're supposed to be f allowed to fully flourish. Mm -hmm. So this takes us a bit of back to the Ed Shaw story earlier, system isn't working. And it hasn't been working with women bishops, and women priests in the Church of England, where if you disagree on doctrinal or theological grounds, uh, you have a valued place in the church and will be allowed to flourish. That has shown not to be true, even though it's laid down in guiding principles. And now Ed Shaw is thinking that we can have a new series of guiding principles that protects those who disagree with where the majority wants to go on gay marriage. It hasn't worked once in the Church of England with women, has not worked at all in the Episcopal Church, in the Canadian Church. And um, it just takes us back to Ed Shaw. Too little, too late, um, complaining about something that, friends, you, you're playing in the wrong game. You're playing a gentleman's game, and uh, your opponents are using every trick they can to do, trip you up and to destroy and defeat you. Can't we just get along is a, a cry out of hell not out of heaven you know so all right let's uh move on to our next story and i'm sorry for our folks who are listeners who do not live in the u.s but george and i live here and we have an election coming up in november uh it's a repeat of the last election it's uh, uh donald trump versus joseph biden and uh, every once in a while, George and I will uh, put our opinions out there as to the election, because that's what we do. But more specifically about the spiritual side or the, the Christian political side or the religious political side of topics. And out there, we've seen a statement last week from Donald Trump regarding abortion saying, um, I'm not anti-abortion. My view is that the state sh should decide. And that's what happened when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. They returned the issue to the state, saying the Constitution, the, US, United, the Constitution of the U.S. has never had abortion rights, and unless it's rewritten, never will. If a state has abortion rights, 
um, reproductive rights that we've got, they can. And the Supreme Court will fully support a state that has either a uh, uh, anti-abortion law or a pro-abortion law. That's what our Supreme Court said uh, in their overturning to Roe v. Wade. Donald Trump is saying the same thing here. He says, uh, I'm not anti-abortion. I'm not pro-whatever life. You know, I'm not in the middle. I think states should um, decide. Now, we have had Donald Trump as president for four years overturn a lot of stuff by who he appointed to the Supreme Court where that that old axiom where God can use bad for good worked, George. In, in my term, it, 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 me as a person, I go, I think Donald Trump is a disaster. But boy, he made me a lot of money and he was able to overturn that disastrous law called Roe v. Wade, I, I, I stood up and cheered, finally. But it took, in my mind, a disaster of a president to do it. Other people have a different opinion of it, and they should. But God can use bad for good. And the Christians are now saying, what, what do you mean Donald Trump is not pro-life? I thought he was pro-life. I can't support him anymore. Well, I don't know, because he delivered you on, on Roe v. Wade, George. What What's going on with the Christians out there? Well, the vast majority of uh, Trump's base has not shifted one iota. Yeah. Donald Trump has the, the white male vote. He has the working class vote. He had, He's now up to 30% with Latino the uh, African-American yeah. male vote. Yeah, yeah. He has the majority in the Latino vote. Yeah. And unless there's... It, you know, things can happen, things can change, and we don't know. But it looks like he's going to win in a runaway election if there's no fiddling or cheating. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutists on the abortion position have thrown up their hands in disgust with Donald Trump because he's not said that abortion must be illegal everywhere at all times and in all places. Mm -hmm. He's said that that is a local decision to be made by the states. And Prominent Christians, uh, such as Billy Gra uh, Franklin Graham, have said, look, it's not ideal, but it is the steps in the right direction. Because what that means is that places like Texas and Florida, major large states that are more traditionally minded, will, at Alabama, Mississippi, the, most of the South, will move towards restricting abortion in Whereas in Massachusetts or California, where the legislatures are more liberal, they'll keep it wide open. And you're not going to be able to, uh, with national laws, uh, com compel compliance. We have laws on immigration that are in the books right now. Bullshit. And we do and not, because I've seen the border. The the President of the United States has created policies under Joe Biden and his uh, Homeland Security Chief to basically say we're not going to enforce these laws. Mm -hmm. So if we have laws that uh, decline that abortion is illegal, the, Cal the state of California will not enforce no, them. No. And so this is an example of, uh, well, two things I want to make here. One. Politicians are not priests. They're fallen. For, maybe it's because I've been writing about crooked clergy for 30 years. I have no expectations of transparency or honesty <laughs> yeah. at no, or of politicians. But as you said, God uses each of us in ways for his glory. We just have to be open to the movement of the spirit. Yeah. Uh, can a Christian vote? For, now, I read these things for people who are not Americans who basically said they cannot understand Donald Trump's uh, popularity. Well, Kevin, as I've mentioned many times, I live in Hooterville, yes. very poor. <laughs> yeah. uh, my, county, my county is the poorest, the second oldest, and has the highest unemployment rate in Florida, and is 97% white. So I have a lot, of, we have a lot of poor whites in this county. Um, and we have lots of problems, drugs and this and that and the other. But this county will go 80, 90% for Donald Trump because the people believe he has their interests at heart. 
this is a billionaire. This is somebody whose life is so different from theirs, yet he is a tribune of the people, if you will, standing against the senatorial class. And sometimes you have to basically take the good, bad with the good to achieve a better end in politics. If I, would, if I were, if Donald Trump were to be standing for election as a bishop, I would look at the other candidate. It's a, but he's not. <laughs> Very good point. You know, but in, in, in as such, if God can use Kevin, God can clearly use Donald Trump. Okay. It, it, you know, and we, he, Christian history is just, you know, a, a vivid representation of that. That the characters of the past that God is using were uh, every bit as bad as Donald in many ways. So... Uh, I'll lay before they became Christians, but I, you know, George and I will have to return to this topic uh, over the next couple of months, and uh, um, it will be interesting to to say the least. George, uh, we reported certainly on uh, churches that have been almost destroyed by fire, Notre Dame, uh, which is going to be open uh, by the Olympics uh, in France. In a couple of years, I think they were shooting for the a twenty, the end of twenty twenty four, beginning of twenty five to to reopen Notre Dame. Wow, because you and I watched that fire. We saw the steeple burn and fall into the the nave. Uh, but we reported many years ago on the uh, New Zealand uh, Christ Church that was almost destroyed by an earthquake, and we mentioned that they're trying to raise money and campaigning um, to to be able to rebuild their church, and we got. An updated news report on that today, uh, this week, George. What did it say? Christchurch Cathedral in the South Island of New Zealand is probably the nicest cathedral in the Southern Hemisphere, or sure. it, was. it was. Beautiful rose window, mm. beautiful uh, 19th century Gothic, just a lovely, lovely church. It was almost destroyed by the major earthquake they had oh, almost 10 years ago. I don't know exactly, well, yeah. not eight years ago. Yeah. And... <clears throat> problem was they were underinsured so the, co the the amount of money they had to insure it was far less than what it actually would take to rebuild it as it was and they've gone through various steps they if they were famous for having a cardboard or a temporary cathedral while they were under construction but now they find that they run out of money in the insurance proceeds that church of new zealand doesn't have the money and Elon Musk doesn't live in Christchurch, New Zealand, so he can't go out, give them the hundred million or so they need. So they're going to, they're having to go cap in hand to the government. And the government says, well, I'm sorry, this is not a function of government to take care of your faulty insurance policies or practices. But it used to be a draw so the, for, the, it, I, it was a tourist draw. I would think the government would have oh, yeah. some interest, you know. Yeah, and I'm sure, and so the diocese has put out a statement saying, "Look, you know, there's not money. There's not money coming from the government. We're broke. Um, we're just going to have to put up some plywood over the windows and strap it up, and just wait one day when we've got the money, or another earthquake knocks it down." Okay, hold on. Me memory serves. Didn't they use cardboard right away after yes. they, they used cardboard placards to to represent a non-broken church? Well, they used cardboard to create a portable, mobile yeah. mini cathedral. Yeah, I remember. Okay. And I always wondered if it, when it rained, what happened to the cardboard, but maybe it was stronger stuff. Who knows? But I mean, that's been used. That's been given away to another church as a as a as a permanent building. Problem we have in New Zealand is the problem we're seeing in Europe, uh, which is people are falling away from the Christian faith. The government doesn't see itself as being obligated to maintain a cathedral because New Zealand is not a Christian society. It's a secular society that Christians live in. You know, in the United States and Florida, uh, we are closer to a Christian society uh, than they are in New Zealand. And uh, certainly in Africa, where they're building cathedrals with government money, they see themselves as a Christian society. Ghana, for instance, is building a national cathedral in its capital that has rivaled the great European cathedrals and the government's paying for it because they see this as an expression of their national identity and Christian faith. But 
that has long, may that may have been true in the 19th century in New Zealand, but it's not happening today. No, it's not. Times are different, but what we do is we, we pray for, uh, uh, the people will be drawn back to uh, a relationship with God. That, that's our prayer. Um, and all else will fall into place. The peace you've been looking for will fall into place when uh, people make peace with the living God. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 851 of Anglican Unscripted.